was born July 19, 1909, in Elizabeth, New Jersey, into a middle-class family as a very shy person. The years before I discovered what I now have was that extreme shyness and bewilderment at what is this world and never really feeling that I belonged, fitted into it. Always wanting to be a good person, a good boy, a good youth, a good young man. And I try to do things as things were supposed to have been done doing the right things, getting a good education, being the best in my field. And my natural inclination was towards science, especially the science of the world and man himself. And I was graduated from Rutgers College in 1931 as a physicist, after which I worked 20-some years in physics and in engineering. I have a history of changing frequently from job to type of work I was doing. In physics, I worked at research and development on measuring instruments and uh, automatic control connected with uh, Brown Instrument Company, which became a subsidiary of Honeywell. And in the engineering field, I worked as an electrical engineer, a uh, mechanical engineer, construction engineer, heating and ventilating engineer, marine engineer, actually 14 different fields. I also made attempts actually went into various businesses intertwined with the engineering, wanting to make money, wanting to make it in the world. And all these projects were rather short-lived because whenever I got to a point of success, I lost interest, and because I lost interest, my project would drop away from me. At that time, I did not know what I know now, that what I was seeking was actually the answers to life itself, and that nothing I had worked at would give me that answer. And as the years went by, I became heavy with depression, with sickness, and by 1952, I had been through constant ailments like being jaundiced three or so times a year, constantly with an enlarged liver, kidney stones, spleen trouble, hyper and hypoacidity, ulcers that perforated and formed lesions. And then I had at least 10 years of migraine headache. And then toward the... 1952, I had had two coronary thromboses, and after the second one I was told I wouldn't live much longer, that I might die any day, that I shouldn't even take the effort to go up a step unless I absolutely had to. Also during that period I was getting heavier psychologically and sicker physiologically, and so I was seeking aid. I was constantly with specialists, medical specialists, and I had had four years of psychoanalysis, four times a week, under an associate of Freud, a Dr. Killian Bloom, B-L-U-H-M, and this was the early 40s, who had an office, I think it was East 96th Street. And after four years of psychoanalysis, I was discharged with, quote, some people cannot be helped, unquote. And that was 
quite a shock. However, I never said die. And after the second heart attack, after three days of cogitating with intense fear, a stir, I was extremely fearful of dying. But I realized, I said to myself, you're still breathing, Lester, there's still a chance. So I sat me down and began thinking on an around-the-clock basis. I had been considered a very smart boy, always made the honor roll. I had a four-year scholarship to Rutgers back in the days when not many scholarships were handed out. But then, when I, after the second heart attack and when I was told I wouldn't live, I said to myself, Lester, you are stupid, stupid, stupid. Having lived 43 or so years and having reached the end of the line without happiness, without health, Therefore, all this knowledge that you have accumulated is of no avail. I had studied Watson's behaviorism in the 30s, uh, Freud in the later 30s and early 40s. I had studied the philosophies. I had studied logic. I studied economics. I studied all the major fields of man. And with all that knowledge, there I was at the end of the line. Making me realize that the accumulated knowledge of man was of no use. And so then I decided, start from scratch. Forget all that knowledge. Begin from point zero and see what you can pick up. So I pose the questions, what am I? What is this world? What is my relationship to it? What is mind? What is intelligence? What is happiness? And I began by asking myself, what do I want out of life? And the answer was happiness. And I said, what is that? Oh, that's getting everyone's approval. And that was a shock to me because I realized I was getting large amounts of approval from my family, from my friends, from most people that I knew. And here I was miserable. Investigating further, I went into the moments when I was feeling happiest. And I discovered something which to me was startling at the time, that it was when I was loving that I was happiest. That happiness equated to my capacity to love rather than to being loved. That was the starting point. I began correcting all my thoughts and feelings in that direction from that of wanting to be loved to that of loving. And in that process, I discovered another major thing that kind of shocked me. I saw that I wanted to change this entire world and that that was the cause of my ulcers, or one of the major causes of it. On realizing how much I wanted to change things in this world and that that made me a slave of this world, I made the decision to reverse that. And then I began letting go of all my want and need to control this world. And in the process of following out these two directions, of actually unloading all the subconscious concepts and pressures in those directions, I discovered I was getting happier, freer, lighter, 
and feeling better in general. On seeing that this direction was good, I made the decision that if a slice of the pie tastes as good, I want the whole pie. And I decided not to let go until I got that whole entire pie of happiness and with it the answer to what am I, what is this life, what is my relationship to it. This decision allowed me to, as I claim, get the answer to life itself in a matter of three months' time. And I actually believe if I did it, anyone could do it, if they had that much want to. And in that three month period of time, all the ailments I had in my physical body corrected. All my miseries dropped away. And I ended up in a place in which I was happy all the time with no sorrow. Not that the world stopped pushing against me. It continued. But I was in a a place where I could resolve things almost immediately. Having cleared out all the negative fears, all the negative I cannots, I would focus right in on the answer to every problem and get it very quickly. And so my whole life turned around from being one of formerly being depressed and sick to one of being happy all the time and in perfect health all the time. One of the things that happened in this process was identification with others. I saw that we are all related. We are all interconnected. Our minds are interconnected. Each mind is like a a radio broadcasting and receiving station, that we are all tuned into each other unconsciously, we're we're just not aware of it, and that if a lot of the suppressed energies are allowed out, this becomes obvious to us. And once we identify with everyone else, it's just natural that we want everyone else to discover what we have discovered, that life was meant to be beautiful, meant to be happy all the time with no sorrow, meant to be with perfect health. And so, from that uh, reaching that high point of understanding in 1952, from that time on, I have wanted to help others discover what I discovered. In the early years, I worked with people person to person. Help for each one was dramatic and very effective. However, they would develop a dependency upon me, which would cause them to expect me to do it for them. And this was unconscious in them. And the reason for that is from the day of birth until we are teenagers, everyone does have uh, someone taking care of everything for them, their parents. And it's so deeply ingrained in us today, we still expect and want someone to do it for us. However, no one can do it for us, we must do it by ourselves. The only thing someone else can do for us is to show us the way, show us the method, show us how to get moving in a right direction. So for the first uh, 20 years or so, after giving this freely to anyone who would listen to me, I realized that the, uh, the uh, amount of accomplishment 
was rather minimal, working one-on-one. And it came to me that to get this out to the majority, it would be necessary to set it up in a methodology that could be given out by others to others. And so I evolved the present system, a very specific method of undoing all these suppressed emotions, all the negative feelings, of undoing the inhibitions and compulsions, which are the things that are driving the world today in wrong directions. We have accumulated so much of suppressed energy that it is coming out in devious directions, upsetting our purpose in life, our goals, to the point where instead of making life a beautiful harmony here on earth, we are using the best of our energies in a direction of destroying this earth. We are today poisoning the air, poisoning the water, poisoning the food, and poisoning our minds through radio, TV, and movies. And we have gotten to the place where we cannot see how we are driving ourselves downward and we are continuing in it. And the only way out of this thing is to first recognize that all this accumulated suppression is the cause of this downward direction and that this accumulated suppression must be released in order to get the world in the right direction, in order to get each of us as individuals in the right direction, in order to get us happy, healthy, and prosperous. This method that we have will do just that. However, it being experiential, it must be taught to each one how to release these suppressed energies so that these negative, unwanted feelings are dumped until we are rid of them. And we discover that when these negative energies are out, the efficiency of our minds are at their highest. Thinking is clear. We have a clarity that we never had before. We can see our purpose and direction in life and carry through. We discover that mind is only creative, that what we hold in mind is what materializes for us sooner or later. And that it's only because we're holding these unconscious, suppressed, negative thoughts that negative things keep happening to us. Nineteen seventy three the concept of organizing it into a system came to me. At the time, I was in Arizona. I had left New York in 1958 only because what I was saying to people was really too far from from what they wanted to hear. And so I retired to a very nice place in Arizona. Spent several years (coughs) all by myself, (coughs) sitting around the clock in a beautiful state, until people began coming in to visit me, which caused me to get up and get out and float across the country. I would talk to groups, never made any commitments, I'd just float around, helping them, giving them person to person help as much as I could, nothing in an organized way until 1973 when I realized 
that those who gathered around me and lived nearby were not gaining any more due to their feeling of dependency upon me no matter how much I told them I could not do it for them no matter how many times I told them that they had to do it themselves they were still looking to me to do it so that decision was made to not help people personally but to get it into this package form I did it in 73 I tested it out in Arizona in 74 with educated people with people with no education and with children 10 years and older and discovered that the method was gotten by all and that anyone could use it that it was very simple and very easy if one chose to use it every person has an unlimited ability within him a potential way beyond anything he ever dreamed we have this tremendous potential limited by and cut off by our own thoughts of limitation the I can'ts it's impossible for me to do that these generally accepted limitations are the cause of the limitations that when these limitation concepts are dumped the person discovers he doesn't have any limitations except those that he mentally holds and see in our course is a method of dumping these limitations we discover that locked into our emotions are all the I cannots and that when the emotions are released all that suppressed energy is released the I cannots are released and then we only think I can and when we think only I can the I can manifests and the unusual with it you can have be or do whatever you will or desire once you know this and do it one is, to is totally released on any particular thing no matter how impossible it is if he's totally released that impossible becomes possible that moment when he's totally released intellect is the rational part of mind that reasons and intellectually ties things together relates them feelings experience are a totally different aspect in that they are our feelings and they don't rationalize you can rationalize about them but they themselves are not rational or rational rationalizable if they were we could tell people drop all your negative feelings and they would do it but they can't because intellectually there's no tie there the only thing we can use the intellect for is to direct us toward the feelings to focus us in on the feelings and then work at the feeling level see our course works at the feeling level and the intellect the rational part of the mind is all motivated by our feelings today we think we're free thinkers but we're not our thinking is motivated by our feelings all of it just check it and you'll see so that the prime thing is feelings the secondary thing is rationale and when the secondary thing is trying to explain the primary thing it cannot so that you've got to understand the relationship of feelings to thoughts that they're two different realms and one does not explain the other it's when you get above thought and feeling that you can understand the two of them and how they relate and there's no suppressed energy we're in the highest happiest most felicitous the most knowing state there is the more the suppression the more our attention goes to unconsciously to hold that suppression down the less attention we have for what is here now as we release these suppressed energies we come into present time every feeling throws us into the past because that's where it was developed from 
So when we uh, perceive or calculate on the present with any feelings behind it, we're working with stuck keys from the past and we don't see what's here now. Witness an accident being witnessed by a half a dozen people. You get a half a dozen different reports. And yet it happened one way. Because we see through our past feelings. We see, we're trying to see now through our past. So to get a person to present time, he has to undo his suppressed feelings. And when he has no more suppressed feelings, he's totally here now in present time with his total abilities and capabilities of perceiving and acting and effecting in life what he wants. Originally, our conscious thinking was all conscious. So we set up this system of the unconscious automated behavior. My hand goes in hot water. If it's automated, I don't have to think, gee, I feel a sensation in my fingers. Oh, it's hot. Oh, the heat will damage my skin. I better pull it out, and out I pull it. From past conditioning, the moment I hit hot, my hand bounces out that moment. So originally we were thinking consciously, and then we set up these automatic controls called feelings to give us automated responses, automated protection. And we lost sight of what we were doing, and we kept on programming and programming and programming and programming until we reached the present state of man in which we are overwhelmed with our programming. Did you see Space Odyssey 2001? That's it. The computer began to take over man, remember? Disconnected the life systems, killed everybody except the guy who was outside the ship. But he's still smarter than the computer. He figured out a way how to get back into the ship. He exploded the charge, crashed himself back into the ship, and went right to the banks of the computer and started taking them out. That's exactly the way it is. Uh, our mind is like a computer. We program it. And we've over-programmed it to the point where it's running us now. So, there is yet left a point where we can override the programs. But it's a weak, weak point today. And what we do is strengthen the ability to override and undo the old programs, to pull out the old banks. Goes to the extreme, it's a nervous breakdown. The uh, banks are running us instead of we running them. Uh, now, I discovered a way. See, there are thousands and tens of thousands of programs within us. And what happened was this, the, let's call the feelings as the programs. Thoughts culminated in, into feelings. Then the superficial feelings culminated into fewer feelings that we call emotions. The emotions culminate into still fewer feelings. And when you can get rid of those fewer feelings, you're actually getting rid of all the original. In other words, there are uh, relays that if we undo them, undo all the other automated responses. And this is what I hit upon. You try to get rid of all your grief, you wouldn't do it. So I had to go more basic to the program that causes those programs. So I got to the two basic programs that are causing all the anger, fear, grief, apathy, jealousy, and pride, and I'm eliminating the program that programmed the emotions. And that's one reason why our method is very effective. There's a lot of other built-in goodies about it in that you don't have to go into your past traumas. We take off at the emotion and go deeper to this basic program and work there where there's no uh, formally built up resistance towards getting into it. We don't want to get into our grief. We don't want to get into our anger now. And when you try to get people into it, there's tremendous resistance. They don't want to feel awful. So we get them to a more basic point that they're not used to and don't feel so awful when they touch it. 
And that's another reason why our method is so effective. I guess the third reason is that by using it, they learn that they do it. This is a tremendous thing. We don't do it. They do it themselves. They learn by doing it that they do it themselves. Eliminating the need of a teacher, a guru, the eliminating of a doctor that's had to keep going back to again and again and again, bit by bit by bit. The feelings are so intense now, we can only release part of it each time. It gets less and less as we release. The goal being to rid ourselves of all our feelings of anger, fear, grief, apathy, jealousy, pride and guilt and so forth. And when we release our, ourselves from all these things, we discover that that which is left over is a thing we call love. And that all feelings relative to love are negative and cut off our capacity to love. That's how simple it is. We're in a slave consciousness. 90% of us feel that we must have a job in order to survive. Maybe 10% of us think we don't need a job and go out and do what we want to do and survive. When this apathetic slave consciousness is undone by dumping these negative emotions, people won't work for other people. They will work in a constructive, positive donation to society that helps everyone. Today, most people are down at the bottom of the scale. They're very selfish. They're motivated only in what's good for me. They have to undo that in order to be good for themselves and for others. The more selfless we are, the better it is for us. Now, the most selfish thing that I can do for me is to be totally selfless, I have discovered. That the two parallel, they don't, they're not in opposites for me. The more selfless I am, the better it is for me. This is something society has to, to discover yet. Yeah.